The Secrets of Movies and TV Shows is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Movies and TV Shows. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Ghostbusters Afterlife, where we will discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings in this movie, 2021 movie. And joining me today on the panel are Victor Lambs. Hey, Victor. Hi, Dom. And Rob Leonardi. Hey, Rob. How's it going? Folks, before we get into today's show, I want to tell you to remember to like The Secrets of Movies and TV Shows on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash starquestmedia. You can retweet us on X, where we are at SQPN. You can find us on Instagram, where we're at StarQuest Network. And uh, leave us comments wherever you'll find us on social media. We'd love to hear from you. And I want to tell you about another show on the StarQuest Network you're sure to enjoy called The Secrets of Middle Earth, which you can find wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash Middle Earth. All right, Ghostbusters Afterlife, uh, this 2021 movie. Let me give you a recap of what happens, and then we can get into the discussion. Uh, This is a supernatural comedy that serves as a sequel to the original Ghostbusters movies. Directed by Jason Reitman, the story follows a single mother and her two children who move to a small town in Oklahoma, inheriting a decrepit farmhouse from their late grandfather, who is revealed to have been one of the original Ghostbusters. As the town experiences mysterious earthquakes and unexplained phenomena, the family discovers their connection to the original Ghostbusters legacy. With the help of new friends and the guidance of their grandfather's past, they must take up the proton packs and confront a new supernatural threat, paying homage to the legacy of their ancestors while forging their own place in the Ghostbusters saga. Thank you, ChatGPT. Rob, what's your overall impression of this movie? What do you think? I really like this. I think it was a great homage to the first, at least the first one, and maybe not some of the, the second one, but it was really good. It had some great callbacks, even to the cartoons that they came out with, and I really enjoyed it. Excellent. How about you, Victor? Yeah, I'm a big Ghostbusters fan going back to when my dad took me to see the original movie when I was eight or nine years old, and then through Ghostbusters 2, the real Ghostbusters cartoon. Had all the Kenner toys, which unfortunately I got rid of at some point. Because we all did. That's why they're so, um, but, so valuable and, today. <laughs> yeah. And my kids, my, my two younger kids who are 9 and uh, 11 are really into Ghostbusters. We 3D print Ghostbusters props and stuff and they have outfits and toys. And so I'm a huge Ghostbusters fan. And from that perspective, I really enjoyed this movie. It's watching it the first time. It, I thought maybe it wasn't fan servicey enough. Like I was like, why are we spending this time in Oklahoma? Let's get to the mm-hmm. firehouse. But seeing especially what they're doing uh, with the sequel of this movie, I think that was the right call. We needed to close out the story from Ghostbusters 1 and 2 a little bit, deal with the loss of Harold Ramis. And I think it's a really good movie, has really good humor, a really good heart, a lot of really good messages in it. So I really enjoy this movie. So folks may want to check out, if they haven't already, an earlier episode that we've done, episode 49 of Secrets of Movies and TV Shows. Way back, we did this in 2020, the original Ghostbusters movie. And so it we did that before this movie existed. But after the 2016 unfortunate diversion, <laughs> uh, we can talk about that. I don't know yeah. what you're talking about. <laughs> we can refer to that in a bit. But I'll put a link to that in the to today's show notes. But I do want to, you know, I liked this. I liked it the first time I saw it. I I liked it on rewatch. This is a fun movie. It's different. There's much that's different about it. And and I want to get into the, some of the differences, but it really feels connected to the original Ghostbuster feel in a way that the other sequels did not. And other sequels and other franchises don't. It really feels connected. And I want to See if we can figure out what it is. What's that essential Ghostbusters DNA that we've retained? So uh, that said, let's talk about the cast. And one of the things that really stands out to me in this one is they were able to bring back the original cast, everyone who's still alive, essentially, nearly everyone. We get one more character that's in the sequel that's coming up very soon after this releases, the a, a minor character who's very funny. But in this one, we get all of the Ghostbusters. We get Annie Potts, Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Ernie Hudson, 
Uh, we even get Sigourney Weaver in a mid credit scene. So it's great to have her. Um, yep. I was really hoping to see Lewis Tully come back. Which one's? Oh, yes. Oh, uh, yeah. Rick, Rick Moranis. Moranis yeah. That is, I, I wonder, I didn't look at the cast. Li- I'm trying to, I, I don't like spoilers. I didn't look at the cast list for the the new one, the the, the Frozen Kingdom one. Uh, so I don't know if he's going to come back for that one. That would be fun. I don't think so. I think he, I think he decided to stop doing it, acting for a, a bit. Like after he did the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids stuff and. Huh? I think he just pulled out from acting. Yeah, I remember hearing that he his wife died and he decided to set aside his acting career for the sake of his kids. So, yeah. So, yeah, the last thing he did was 2008. Yeah, that would be why, I guess. And then there's the new cast, too. And so we'll talk about them. Probably the best known act, actor in, from the new characters is Paul Rudd, who is people will know from Ant-Man and stuff. But... I, I think Paul Rudd's hilarious. It's, I, I don't know. Is that is I, maybe he's not everybody's cup of tea? I find him hilarious as well, and I like how he was able to tone down certain aspects of his <laughs> normal comedic. He's got a wide range, and he plays a scientist, but has great chemistry with Carrie Coons, who plays mm-hmm. Callie Spangler, the mom, and then the kids as well. Yeah, I think he really makes the movie as, as the heart and the the, the comedy of, of the movie. There's one scene where he's walking through Walmart <laughs> and just like picking up products. And there he's a little bit more goofy. So I don't know if they filmed that scene separately or, or first or something. But we do get to see more of his comedic range in that particular Walmart scene. Yeah, not, not only that, but you get the whole throwback to Ant-Man with the whole Baskin Robbins ice cream. Yes. <laughs> oh, I miss that. <laughs> I think that, he, that was a nice time for him just to have a little solo of him being funny. <laughs> That's true. That's his only, really his only scene where it's just him being funny, comedic, and crazy things happening around him. Yeah, that's true. And you mentioned the kids. It's interesting. The, this is a movie with the kids as main, as the main characters, as opposed to adult men. And I don't know if that's more indicative of the times we live in, like that there are more movies that are like that, where they seem more focused on kids than adults. Whereas this sort of movie would be more back in the eighties. It was pitched at a grown up crowd. Whereas now things are more pitched at teenagers. What do you think? I honestly think they were trying to ride the high off of stranger things. And they even brought in Flynn Wolfhard, which yeah. Yeah, obviously was one of the main characters in stranger things. And honestly, his character is almost the exact same person. I feel. Yeah. Not a lot of range. <laughs> there. Just, yeah. yeah. It was just, Oh, it's here's Mike again. <laughs> That's um, true. Yeah. But I think McKenna Grace, who plays Phoebe, I think she did a phenomenal job because I know her from young Sheldon and she's a little different in young Sheldon, but you have that really awkward, but absolutely hilarious. A lot of deadpan comedy happening. Right. Yes. Her penchant for horrible dad jokes (laughs) and riddles and stuff carries through the movie. And and, uh, yeah, she, she does an amazing job. She's definitely also the one of the centers of the movie and carries it. I think it wouldn't without the strength of the child actors, Mm -hmm. including the the character podcast played by Logan Kim, who I adore too, is the younger version of Ray. in this. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. 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 That's the interesting thing is that each of these characters, like the kids has their, the version of them from the adult group. So you have McKenna. I got to look at the cast list because I can remember the names. I always have to do this. So Phoebe is Egon. Trevor, played by Finn Wolfhard, is definitely the Peter Venkman. Um, I don't know, because podcast Ooh. is totally Ray. Ray. And the girl, Lucky, is Ernie, uh, is Winston. Winston? Yeah. I actually think Finn might be more of the Winston and Lucky might be more of the Venkman because she's got more of the jokey attitude and stuff. So Yeah, I can see that with the just, whole, like, the, oh, here's my hoodie, borrow it. Oh, it's my boyfriend's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, but, but at the I, same time, I think there's some room for inter- interpretation. Yeah, at the same there, time, yeah. I think they blended them well because Phoebe is has a lot. Uh, Phoebe is very strong in the com- comedy, I think, which is the whole Vinkman vibe. Yeah, and, and what I really like, so McKenna Grace, the actress who plays Phoebe, she's actually made a career in scary movies. She's been in as a kid. She's been in Return to Amityville, one of the Annabelle movies, 
The Haunting of Hill House. As a little girl, she's been in some scary stuff. <laughs> and then you got Finn Wolfhard from Stranger Things. So I think they were really leaning on these kids coming from a horror background, but bringing it to a comedy horror sort of film, which yeah. I think works. Yeah. And I think Ghostbusters, certainly after the movie came out and it was a runaway hit, the 1984 movie wasn't intended to be a kid's movie, although they did tone it down a little bit to get the PG yeah. rating. Um, Which is hilarious and because I think that would be a PG-13 if it went through today. Yeah. <laughs> oh, ab absolutely. Even Afterlife was a PG-13 because yeah. of the awesome language and frightening situations. But certainly when the cartoon came out and then Ghostbusters 2 and, and the different video games, it became much more of a kid-friendly brand. That's true. And I think this is a great way to honor the legacy while introducing it to kids today like mine some of the less the secondary characters so you had josh gad voiced the ghost muncher the one who ate the, the metal mm -hmm. which is funny because yep. uh, he's also olaf in the frozen movies and then you had <laughs> for gozer the body i love the autocorrect in my notes changed it from gozer to gore yeah. uh, gozer <laughs> the body was olivia wilde but the voice yes. was yes. the actress Shora Agdashlu. She's an Iranian actress. And if you don't know her by the name, you've seen her in everything. She's been in an Expanse. She's been in a whole bunch of stuff. She's fantastic. I love her in whatever she does. And her voice, she's got that very sort of deep, gravelly woman's voice, which works for Gozer. That yeah. was really good. And the Bokeem Woodbine is the sheriff who has been acting for, for a very mm -hmm. long time. J.K. Simmons shows up as Evo, as Evo Shandor, but only for he had to uh, very split. briefly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he had to split. Indeed. I've been waiting to, to give that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Even Bob Gunton, who played the warden in Shawshank, he is, the movie starts with Egon, although you don't yeah. see his face. He's on a mission. He's doing something. And you're like, oh, they just got some body double to do it. But no, they actually got great Bob actor Dutton to do in yeah. semi makeup. Yeah, in makeup, even though you don't see him and he just sits in it to do it. Yeah. So it's neat. And then at the end, when we do see Egon again, he's CG. But it, it impressed me mm -hmm. that they got an actor to basically do a stand in role. And we should point out that Harold Ramis did die in 2014. So sadly, uh, yes, may he rest in peace. And one of the bits of DNA in this, besides the actors, is one of the things that really connects us to the original is Ivan Reitman, who wrote and directed the original Ghostbusters, co-wrote this with his son, Jason Reitman, who also directed it. That's, and I think to me, that's a, the essential difference from the 2016 all-female cast Ghostbusters. Yeah, and while they were directing it, Ivan Reitman was on set with Jason Reitman, I think pretty much the entire time. So while it has Jason Reitman's name on it as the director, Ivan Reitman was literally standing behind right. him for, for most of the production. And then Gil Keenan, too, who he's written some movies on Netflix. There's a Christmas one, I think, that he uh, co-wrote, but definitely has that 1980s, 1990s sense of m movie, sense of fun about him where, you know, zany things can happen. It's all about the friendship and camaraderie of, of people as they face off against impossible odds and bringing that humor in. Because this movie is also very funny. There's a lot of really funny lines that parents will get, that the kids will appreciate as well. Uh, it's interesting to me how... For the first half of the movie, maybe I didn't keep track. We don't get e Egon's name mentioned at all. We don't like unless ahead of time you figured it out. You don't know who this dirt farmer was from for till most of the way through this movie or halfway through this movie. I think it's a fascinating risk to take while doing this. It was very risky. That's one of the issues I had first watching that kind of made me a little apprehensive. It's like everybody. When they do talk about Egon, nobody likes him. His his daughter hates him for abandoning her as, as a kid. And we later find out why, you know, his friends, when we do finally get to see some of the former Ghostbusters, they hate him because he ran off with all of their stuff. And you're like, this is Egon. Why does everybody hate him the best? Yeah. I, yeah. I was actually very surprised when I first watched this that it was Egon. I mean, it made sense because Harold was the only one that wasn't alive. But I honestly thought that they did a good job with keeping him in the shadows that it could have been any of them. And that I, I thought Egon in the first movies, he was very much the scientific one where you had Ray that was the I'm going to go off and try to talk to these ghosts and <laughs> do things. Into the paranormal. And I, right. I fully expected yeah, to be a cultist. I, I fully expected it to be Ray to begin with. Mm, yeah, that would make sense. And it's an interesting twist. Who did Egon end up 
marrying though because <laughs> it wasn't so they they yeah. don't say and i actually i i was going through s- doing some research and things like that and apparently the uh director came out and said that th- he had a family even before ghostbusters one that he started so that the mom was born in 82. Oh. That would make sense. So he'd already left them by then. Because there was because Janine Melnitz was the played by Annie Potts, was the love interest in for him in the first Ghostbusters movie. But he so he'd already left his family. They'd already had a split. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Because the mom's yeah. old enough, yeah, that it would be makes sense. Yeah. And then I there's also a cartoon called Extreme Ghostbusters, which is a sequel to the real Ghostbusters. Like they did a time jump for like the 90s kids. Uh, and yeah. in that they had more of a, a relationship because in Ghostbusters 2, Janine had a completely different love interest in that one. Right. That's true. Yep. <laughs> there was a there was. So we should recap. So there were three Ghostbusters movies featuring the original cast. Counting Afterlife. There was two. There were plans for Ghostbusters 3. And the unofficial Ghostbusters 3 that's about as official as you can get is a 2009 video game. That has been re-released numerous times, so it's now available on every modern Uh console, Switch, PC. And it was co-written by Dan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis, has the entire original cast minus Rick Moranis and Sigourney Weaver in it. But it basically, even William Atherton as Walter Peck Mm -hmm. is in it. Brian Doyle Murray is the mayor. Alyssa Milano is in it as a new love interest. But it it basically wraps up the Gozer and Evo Shandor um, storyline in a different way. It's not canon now because this movie kind of supersedes it. But I would, if you love Ghostbusters and want a really good story with the original cast, check out the 2009 video game just called Ghostbusters, the video game. Okay. Yeah, it's really good. They Stay Puff is in it. <laughs> Slimer's in it. You can explore the firehouse. Uh, there is a new game out too called Spirits Unleashed. It's more of a multiplayer squad type asynchronous multiplayer where one person's the ghost and the other people are the Ghostbusters. <laughs> it's a lot of fun too. Interesting. There was a okay, that's cool. There was a 1986 animated Ghostbusters from Filmation that has nothing to do with this. <laughs> no, they, they originally were going to a... create like a Ghostbusters cartoon. Then the real Ghostbusters cartoon came out and they will just they wrote a pilot and it never went anywhere. OK. Yeah. The Filmation cartoon is with the one with the gorilla, the bone phone. And it was based on a 1970s TV right. show because that yeah. came out. They were trying to capitalize on the movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they almost did. Weren't able to call Ghostbusters Ghostbusters because of the pre-existing TV show. They were going to call it like Ghost Smashers or uh, something. And there's also. Yeah, I know. And, okay. I was going to say, I know in like extreme Ghostbusters, I be, if I remember right, because I, I was able to get the other ones for my lo- local library, <laughs> the co-op that with the library, but I couldn't find any of the extreme Ghostbusters. But I remember that as a kid. I remember Egon and Janine having a, a relationship in that one, but they were all like a little different <laughs> in that one. Was there yeah. another s- animated series or maybe there, it's in production, Ghostbusters Ecto Force? I think it must be in production because Gaten Matarazzo, yeah, that would be a another one. Stranger Things alum, is listed as being in the cast of that, but nothing else. So hmm. there's also a, a VR video game as well. Yeah. So that that might be the, the it's VR currently video on game hold or something. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I've seen ads for the VR video game. In any case, uh, so then there was these two, and then there was the 2016 movie, which was confusingly just named Ghostbusters. <laughs> no one, no two, no three. And there was a lot of a parallel universe. Yeah, it's been retcon. The title's been retconned, so it's now Ghostbusters. Answer the oh, call. Oh, has it? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, a lot of fan pushback on that, and it was interpreted to be like, oh, because they're women, and I, I don't think that was for the primary reason. Ivan Reitman was attached to that, by the way. Let's just put it put it out there. He was one of the co-writers. I love Paul Feig. He's from around where I live, and. I liked Freaks and Geeks, his show that he did. He did a TV show called Other Space, which is only 11 episodes, but it's hilarious. But he didn't make a Ghostbusters movie. He made a Paul Feig comedy. And I I love all the actresses who are in it. Leslie Jones, Kate McKinnon, Kristen Wiig, Melissa McCarthy, and of course, Christopher, not here at all, but Helmsworth. All really good actors. There's a lot of funny humor in it, but it's not ghostbusters humor they didn't double down enough on like kind of more horror and supernatural aspects of it it was pushed aside just so they could make wacky jokes right, right. yeah i'm looking at looking at the cast because i never saw that one because i just 
didn't really float my boat. But apparently, all the the original Ghostbusters came back in different roles for it. Yes. Don't watch it for that because they basically destroy their legacy in these roles. <laughs> Bill Murray famously wanted to die in one of the Ghostbusters movies, just like uh, Harrison Ford wanted to die in a Star Wars movie. So he basically comes back as just this guy who falls on a window and dies. Right, oh. right. <laughs> yeah, that's his cameo. So let's talk about this movie that we, we're talking about. One of the things I really like about Phoebe and, and Egon is they are non-neurotypical shall we say, this is the modern language that we use. They are, we would yep. say, either on the spectrum or autistic. And Phoebe comes right and says she doesn't express emotions like other people do. She express, she, she has them on the inside that you just don't see them on the outside. And that's one of the things I really love. I've got non-neurotypical kids. I love the idea that I'm, I'm not super into representation as an end in itself, but I love the fact that the hero of this is a young girl who is non-neurotypical, and that actually helps her to win the day in this, which is uh, satisfying. Yeah, yeah. when they I, come in Carl's Muncher for the first time, the podcast is freaking out, and she's overstimulation calms me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. That's right. <laughs> that's awesome. And that's a, a callback to the original movie where they're facing off against Gozer, and, and Egon says something like, Ray, I'm terrified beyond the capacity for rational thought. <laughs> you freak it out. And just, <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah. <laughs> that was great. Yeah, I like that. I liked her friendship with Podcast, too, because Podcast is another outsider. Yep. We're introduced to him in the uh, summer school classroom, and he's, hi, I'm Podcast. And, and she's like, why do they call you Podcast? And he's like, I call me myself Podcast <laughs> because of my podcast. <laughs> Which is I, I such could, a podcaster yes. thing to say. <laughs> I could totally see him as like a, a kid nowadays trying to make a Jimmy Akers Mysterious World. <laughs> he's a TikToker or oh, a absolutely. YouTuber or a, yeah. Or 30 years ago in the Goonies, it was, oh, the... Not Chunk. No, but. the Asian actor who was just in every, everything everywhere all at once. Oh, Getty Watanabe? No. Or, not Getty Watanabe, um, but... Key... Oh, Ki Hu yeah. Kwan, yeah, uh, yeah, Data. Yes, Data in, in the Goonies. Whether he's the video camera or the recording, but he's, I imagine myself in this future career thing, kid. I love the fact yeah. that his podcast is entirely contained on a thumb drive. He, like, he doesn't post it anywhere, or maybe he does, but he carries around a thumb drive with all the episodes on it, which I guess I should start doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here you go, listen. <laughs> yeah, and there's a touching moment with Ray at the end where it turns out Ray is his single listener and has been, like, listening all along. Mystical Tales of the Unknown Universe, which, mm. if that's not a Jimmy Akin's yeah. Mysterious World uh, title, I don't know what is. <laughs> that I felt a real affinity with podcast in this one. And then you have the mom. She's really offbeat as a mom. Like, if Egon had a daughter that wasn't exactly like him, she is an unconventional mom instead of building their kids up. She says things like, yeah, you're an idiot. Or what do you know? And you're like, don't go, don't be yourself. That's what the, <laughs> which they both yeah. know is a term of endearment between them. I did like that. So when we first meet the Spanglers, they're being evicted from their apartment in, I think, New Jersey or something. I, I or Chicago, it's, it's maybe. Explicitly say that. Because they had Illinois Chi plates yeah, on, the, Chicago. on the station wagon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so they their their grandfather or father has just died. And so they have to go out to the house, but they have no plans to move back because there there's no life for them there. And yeah, so I, I I think very good representation of the broke single mom who's very weary, very cynical, feels abandoned by her father. And that's defined her and her the father of her kids. And that's defined her. And humor is one of her coping mechanisms there but the very funny joke when they arrive in this one horse town or this podunkville in oklahoma trevor is with his cell phone trying to get a signal and says there's no bars there's no bars here and she says oh there better be a bar <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes and then they get to the house and it's this broken down awful like i could smell what it smelled like you know what i mean you like that, that musty smell of this ancient place that's not been taken care of with quotes from Revelation written to make it as creepy as possible. <laughs> Which is a great callback to go, the first Ghostbusters, because that's what yep. Winston and Ray say to quote, although they misquoted as Revelation 712. <laughs> yes, it's uh, 612, um, right? 6, 612, yeah. they yep. get it better. In the, yeah, they get it right in this one. Yep. And Ray's tattoo Ray's is tattoos correct. Ray's on right? it, and it's all over. <laughs> yep. But was, it was June, right, that, that when they arrived there, right? Yeah, it was just after yeah, the school so year. June 12th, maybe? Yeah. I kept waiting for the, because oh. Revelation, I was waiting for oh, that 612 yeah. to refer to June 12th and then, then come uh, out and say, okay. maybe that got cut 
or something, but I was waiting for that to come up. It was weird, but yeah, it's, it would be funny if that was the, the case. Yeah. And so in the house, it's very clear that there is a, a ghost or a spirit there because at the beginning of the movie, we see the, the dirt farmer. We don't necessarily know who he is. He is killed by a, a supernatural force, but before he is able to put a ghost trap into the floor hidden behind this kind of sliding mm -hmm. puzzle of the uh, floor tile or floor. And it's very clear that there is some paranormal entity there. Phoebe sets up a chessboard and finds that the pieces are moving. She's guided with lights turning on down to a secret laboratory, which at that point you start to kick the plot into yep. gear. Yeah. But and then you had uh, the PKE meter the that you PKE. share, which went off shortly after Egon died, showing that, hey, he's still here. That was a very nice yeah, touch. Very nice. Yeah. And then when they first come into the house, you have the stack of books, which goes back to the library in the first Ghostbusters. Yes, where book stacking. You have the stack of books and... and <laughs> Vequins, yeah, no, no non-paranormal entity <laughs> would stack books this way. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm looking around my house. And all that. But it is interesting because ghosts, and, and this is going back to the first Ghostbusters, and certainly in, in popular culture, I think we've refined the term a little bit now, but ghosts would refer to any kind of paranormal entity or, or spirit, not necessarily departed human souls, but elemental spirits or non-human non spirits as well. And so all through the Ghostbusters franchise, there's been a mix of, oh, here's the, the people who died on the Titanic versus here's a creature made out of slime who may have been somebody who liked food or may just be like a spirit of gluttony. Yes. So it's, it, but we very clearly have the ghost of Egon Spengler and maybe due to his research, he's able to control himself on the next plane uh, a little bit better. It's never really I'll take explained. a moment to talk about the Catholic teaching on ghosts, yeah. which is that there is allowance for yeah. the existence of ghosts in Catholic teaching that I refer you to the very first episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we discuss that topic. You can find that at mysterious.fm slash 001, or just go to, no, mysterious.fm slash one. I think I don't even put the leading zeros in. But in any case, go, and there are ghosts in the Bible. The, the King David goes to speak to the, at the Witch of Endor, where they speak to the ghost of uh, Samuel, ghosts as themselves are not incompatible with Catholic teaching. Now, the way ghosts are presented in this movie, it's all fa fantasy and fun and just whatever. It's, I wouldn't take it very seriously uh, too far, but it is a thing. And there are hauntings and apparitions. There are technical differences between those uh, things. I don't want to get too much into it. Again, including demons. Yeah, right, including demons. <laughs> yeah. Again, I refer you to Mysterious World for more detail on the reality of such those sorts of things or the theoretical realities, shall we say. We should mention what Revelation 6.12 says, just to close the loop on that. It says, and I beheld, this is the King James Version because it's cooler when you say it that way. <laughs> and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood. You don't get lows in like the good news version. Yeah. And as a result of having this written on his property and just basically tilling the land and not farming dirt. And later on, we figure out what he's been doing with the land and why it's so important to the future of humanity. The people in town just refer to him as the dirt farmer. Nobody misses him now that he's dead. We're talking about Egon here. And it's just another one of those things. It's why is everybody being so mean to Egon? But he's indicated right. at the end there. But he does have a really cool underground lab, which you can access, of course, through a fire of course, underneath the lab's garage. <laughs> And lots of really good callbacks. There is collection of spores, molds, and funguses <laughs> yes. that he mentioned he was collecting and is, is there. One of the main themes of this movie, and the one that I really like, is we mentioned Callie really has a lot of resentment towards her father for abandoning her and showing what she thinks no interest in her as she's grown up. And it's when she finally does make it down into this underground lab and workshop that she finds all the photos of her that he has been collecting all through her childhood and that he really did care about her, but for a reason she doesn't understand yet, couldn't be with her as she was growing up. And this pays off in the end where I don't want to give away the ending necessarily, but oh, we're spoilers um, here. She does yeah. have, have <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. She does have a chance to, to very physically reconcile with her father, even though her father is dead. And I, that's what I appreciate that even though we've lost loved ones, we may, have resentment towards them. We may have resentment towards ourselves, towards the way we treated them while, while they were alive too. There's always a chance to reconcile with them, certainly for our own benefit right. and maybe to some degree for theirs as well. 
And that that's the I'm tearing up now just thinking about it because it's such a really nice ending. And if you lose an actor for your movie franchise, this is the way oh, yeah. you deal with it. Definitely. The, that's a, a great point because it's a movie about ghosts, but it's it, we all have or we may all have ghosts in our lives, figurative ghosts of the ones we have lost and the regrets that we have because of them. And Ali gets the chance to bust that ghost, shall we say, to reconcile with her father. Yeah. And we have that chance because the people we've lost aren't gone. We still are connected to them through the community, the communion of saints, the great cloud of witnesses that surround us. As we record this, it's almost exactly a year since I lost my mom. And I'm not going to get emotional. And <laughs> my mom and I were in good graces. I, she had dementia, so we were losing her before she died. And it's, it's great to think of how we are still connected. My, I don't, things don't move around in my house of their own accord, please. But <laughs> please don't do that, mom. But I still feel connected <laughs> to my mom because of my faith that she's still there. And, and that, you're right, Victor. That is the heart and soul of this movie is that reconciliation and that connection and the connection that, that Phoebe gets to have with Egon because they're so much alike. And it makes me nostalgic for the sense of, wow, I could picture a granddad Egon if he hadn't died with Phoebe building stuff together in the lab. And she gets to do that with him, even though he's now a ghost. And I think that, that you're right. That is the heart of the movie. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, and especially yeah. just the idea of, at the very end, he at least seemingly passes on. And the idea of us, especially as, as Catholics, like, praying for those who have left us and keeping that connection with them. Mm -hmm. And I love that the movie ends right there. There's a couple of post-credit sequence or mid-credit sequence. He, they hug, they embrace, he passes on, and that's the end of the right. movie. Well, there's no, that just happened. Let's walk around the field and <laughs> discuss the implications of it. It's no, that's the end of the movie. And then we get a nice little cameo from Sigourney Weaver and then something that sets up the But the I'm sequel. connected to the story, but, which is good. Yeah. Yeah. Phoebe has yep. the whole Marvel Avengers thing. Yeah. <laughs> Phoebe yeah. has a great line after she's met Egon. They're at the smelting foundry testing out the proton pack. And she's with Pat Podcast. She says, I met my grandpa last night. And Podcast says, was he howling and clanking chains? No, that would have been weird. <laughs> like, your grandfather, you met your grandfather who's dead. But that's not weird. That was, that was great. Well, he was already, with, especially with this podcast, he was already welcomed to the weirdness and the mysteriousness of things. And he was the first one to bring up like, Oh, did he die of unnatural causes? He, and she's no yeah. natural ones. Everything he brings up in that first encounter is, is actually what happened. Like he calls it from the beginning. <laughs> yeah. I, thought, I, I thought it was hysterical watching this again, the second time, realizing how podcast knew what was going on from the start. Now he sees mysterious happenings everywhere he looks in this town. And is it because there are real it's a real haunted town or is it because he's just one of those people who's primed to find strange things wherever he looks? You never know. Yeah. Yep. Even in the whole, like the final battle sequence, he was off battling his own problem with all the mini marshmallows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the mini puffs are, I wasn't sure about them at first, but I watched this again and the kids have seen it. We watched it again last night and the kids were just howling at the scene with the mini puffs in, in, the, in Walmart as they're just so happy and demented. <laughs> the other each other. Chair and then puts them over the grill. <laughs> I'm just they're so coming happy back and... for the sequel too. I saw yeah. one where they're turning one through a pencil sharpener. <laughs> yes, yeah. I'm, oh yeah. yeah. I'm not sure my kids would handle the scary bits of this so well. I wish they could because it would be. It would be it's funny. Yeah, I think aside from a little language and a little, you, you still have the. So there are connections to the original Ghostbuster. There's still Gozer the Gozerian, who is the ancient Sumerian yeah. god who. Evo Shandor wanted to bring back in the first movie, and he did this by building a apartment building in Manhattan that acted as a superconductor for spiritual energy. And in this, we find out that he actually opened the mine in this town in Oklahoma to mine selenium that was used in the girders to build the apartment building in the right. first movie. And also, he's built or found there, but I think he built it a, a temple to Gozer which is a really cool, creepy yeah. set. There's like skeletal forms writhing in pain and a big statue of Gozer. Uh, and then this big chamber that's used for human sacrifices, basically where they would throw in offerings. And Gozer has been trying to come back every day through this. And Egon at some point built a contraption that every day activates a number of uh, neutrona wands to fire a concentrated neutrona burst into this well and basically keep Gozer from coming back. And it's basically a dead man switch. 
every day this has to happen until Gary Gruberson releases one of the the terror dogs and yeah let's talk about uh, that oh let's i found this trap i could see something's in it let's release it yeah (laughs) what's cool about the movie not not to get uh, away from that we'll come back to that but it's always did the events in the original ghostbusters happen because in answer the call the 2016 movie it's a complete alternate timeline they never happen but in this it's like why doesn't everybody know about ghosts and they do explain there was that one incident that happened in 1984 but it's like the way young kids look at 9-11 or the Kennedy assassination now. It's just okay. Yeah. Something well, and then Gary, yeah, Gary did say that there hadn't been a ghost sighting in 30 years. Like ever since. Yeah. yeah. But but it, they did find ancient maps to Somerville, which is the town they live yeah. in. So like that, I think that temple had to be there because that temple had in okay. there years. It had 1883, 1908, 1945, 1984, 2021. I was also able to catch 2134 and then 22 something. <laughs> oh, wow. So, you know, maybe uh, no, in 100 yeah. years, we're going to have another sequel. <laughs> yeah, you can't keep a good gozer down. but <laughs> Or a bad one. Yeah. And so I think that was, yeah, that was one of the good, like, key moments for me is Phoebe and podcast have this ghost trap. They have no idea what it is. So they bring it into school. It's just sitting on the table and Gary comes over and says, is that a cool prop? <laughs> and then he finds out it's real. And that's like one of the first connections that, oh, this does take place in that same larger universe. And the, there are people who remember the Ghostbusters. She, yeah. at one point, Phoebe watches their commercial on YouTube. We're ready to believe you commercial. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I really appreciate that this movie Compared to the first one, I would say toned down the sexuality a lot. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of sexual innuendos in the first one, if not blatantly stuff. And obviously, they still had to keep the whole key master and Get, gatekeeper, gatekeeper yeah. thing. Yeah. But they were very brief. It was very, I think it was, that was very well done versus what they did in the first movie. Right. The adults knew what was going on. Older kids probably know what's going on, but they don't have to yeah. come out <laughs> and bang you over the head with it. Yeah. Yeah. And I I love the fact that Phoebe early on says, I don't believe in ghosts. Like she's just clearly, I don't believe in ghosts. I believe in science. And then she's remarkably phlegmatic about it when the chessboard starts moving things like, oh, I guess there are ghosts. Like she just doesn't, she just switches like that. (laughs) Okay, I guess there's ghosts as soon as she has evidence. And I thought that was pretty fun, that one. Yeah, Trevor kind of did the same thing where he he was introduced as this, almost a jerk to his, to everyone around stereotypical teenager trying to just get a girlfriend. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then all of a sudden, Oh, Hey, I started the Ecto one and drove around a cornfield. Oh, you have problems. Let's go. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and I love the way they introduced the Ecto one too. It's the metaphor for the franchise. It's rusting in a barn. Yep. You know, has been neglected for decades and then a kid finds it and starts to peel back the tarp over it, manage it's all rusty. They managed to get it running And of course, Egon gives the final little push there by fixing the wiring in the car in order to get fired up because Phoebe's in trouble. He knows that. And so he fixes the car. And and I do like that there are a couple little extra surprises with the Ecto-1 oh, yes. too. The, uh, the remote control trap. The remote control trap. That was, yeah. And the, and the, the gunner seat is. That is awesome. awesome. And, then I, and then they even, in the next one, they even added more stuff to it. So yeah. I'm excited yeah. for that. I can't yeah. wait to see that. Uh, that. Although that remote control car with the ghost trap is a fast because <laughs> that car with the Ecto one yeah. was going like 70 <laughs> and super battery. It must be like nuclear powered, but it's yeah, it has a part. Well, and then they did, it did the exact <laughs> yeah. same moves as the Ecto one too. Like it skidded on its side. <laughs> yeah. And it was awesome. It was, I really like that one. Yeah. yeah. You had to have a scene where they're going through the town chasing a ghost blasting everything that's like a an homage to the original you have to have a scene where all the ghosts are released and come out in the town yep and, and although there was no catchy pop tune associated with it remember in the yep. original there was a catchy pop tune as the ghosts were going through new york city you didn't really have that this time i found the yeah. music interesting there was a I great lo- part speaking of the music where the kids were, were going up to the top of the teenagers going to the top of the the, the mine and you had the pop music and just underneath it was the orchestral creepy music that was rising and then eventually overpowers the pop music. I thought it was a great way of using music to give you an indication of what's going on. Something's coming up from below. Yeah, we, we do get a lot of the from the original movie. We get a lot of the Elmer Bernstein firehouse or main Ghostbusters theme. That's the kind of yep. piano music, that kind of quirky theme. But then, yeah, you're right. Instead of getting 80s music like we got in the original Ghostbusters or a lot of Bobby Brown in the 1989 movie, it's pop music and soul music from the 60s. We have a Funkadelic song on Mm. on there. 
a bunch of other. And I thought it was really interesting. I don't know if Dan Aykroyd had a hand in picking the music or if it was the other producers, but it adds to the timelessness uh, right. of it. As well. they, they created a new song for the Ghostbusters and created a new song for Ghostbusters 2. They didn't create a new song of Busting Ghosts for this right. one, which is... I was able to go back and they have the music videos on the Blu-ray and, and it, they're hilarious to watch. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> Cause it's all like eighties yeah. music videos, but I was, I don't know. I was sad that wasn't a thing for this. But one. we did get the original pop song at the very end, which yeah. Yeah. They're just so good. Yeah. Just, I, I love that. That yeah. song really takes me back to this, to, to the original and really connected this in that way. And it had to come at that emotional moment at the end of the movie. I really, I, I was really glad that we eventually did get it. And then McKenna Grace does a song on the, during the does credits she really? Too. I didn't know that. Yeah. The song Haunted House that was after the Ghostbusters theme is her, I believe. Yeah. The, Gruberson, the Paul Rudd character, which is a great Gary Gruberson. Is in, yeah. The names <laughs> are great in this. Yeah. He's in town. As a sort of undercover seismologist, he's got a job as a, a summer school teacher where he's really there just to check out this weird seismic activity and that Phoebe knows all about as she's looking at the charts. And he becomes the that connection to the past who reveals to the kids what's going on. And there's that great moment where they're going to they've got the trap. They've got it hooked up to the battery on the bus and a podcast says, is this safe? And he says, of course, it's not safe. History is safe. Geometry, that's safe. Science is all particle accelerators and hydrogen bombs. <laughs> Science is giving yourself the plague and gambling on the cure. Science is reckless. Totally. Yes, it's punk rock. And I just love yeah. that moment. It's, that's so fantastic. It's a, it's fun because, yeah, science is, is crazy. It reminds me of, I'm reading Terry Pratchett's Discworld novels now. And it reminds me of the Alchemist Guild in the Discworld novels and just how they're blowing stuff up all the time. It's just this is what we do. It's what you do because it's science. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I thought it was hilarious because he goes and he finds like Cujo on VHS <laughs> and just has the kids watching these horror movies. I think that's a nod to, to play. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you have Chucky play in it. I just think that's a really great like a wink to the audience of this isn't an actual horror movie. Yes. This is yeah. meant to be a comedy. Right. right. <laughs> So the uh, we also have, you mentioned when they get arrested, the kids get arrested for shooting up the town. The one phone call that Phoebe makes is not to her mom, because her, I, I assume she knows her mom's already coming. It's to Ray, Dan Aykroyd. And yep. the first thing he says when you hear Egon's name is, Egon can go to hell. And then she says he's dead. And it, <laughs> you can see Ray, like, crumble inside because he's yeah. mad at Egon. But he doesn't really hate him. It's still his friend. And it's funny because Ray and Egon were, you could tell in the original movie, they were connected. They were friends. That was really a, a nice play by Dan Aykroyd in that. The nice way to play that. Yeah. And then the line that really gets him there is just before the sheriff cuts her off on the phone. She said, he was my grandfather. Yeah. And the way she delivers that line, you could just, and that's what gets him to get the guys back together and gets them out to Oklahoma. Right. Just that one line. Yeah. And, and so then we have the, the final scene where the kids are trying to trap Gozer. It's not working. And so the original Ghostbusters have to show up and they, it's because they're there and the next generation is there that they're able to de finally defeat Gozer until Egon, because they have to have all the Ghostbusters. So Ghost Egon yeah. shows up and helps Phoebe. He holds her in place and that's what does it. And then we get the dogs, the stone dogs, where you have to break your way out from inside and that whole thing. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I loved in the end, the Ray going and making his, you need to depart from here speech and goes are going, are you a God? <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and just stops and they're like, come on. <laughs> yes, I am. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. And then we already talked about the ending there, which was a very emotional and very cool. We do have two, the two mid credit, post credit scenes. The mid credit scene is uh, Bill Data Dana and, and, and Bankman, yeah, Bankman. doing the telepathy test or the whatever you want to call it. Can you read the card? Can you read my mind? And he's actually reading it, but she's getting him to, because he's she can zap him. She's getting to admit the cards are marked. He used to only zap the guys, so on and so forth. And, and she's enjoying it, which is fun. And it's fun that they're still together in this, which is funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was good. at least friends. Yeah. And then finally, the last one where it's revealed that Winston has made a fortune using the confidence and the poise that he got from being a Ghostbuster. 
buys the firehouse, takes the Ecto-1 back there, and we'll learn more in the new movie what's been going on in the firehouse over the past three years. What It looks like there's some sort of laboratory or something going on there, so we'll find out. Which, more about which that. that actually surprised me a bit because Ray said that firehouse got turned into a Starbucks. Maybe he bought it. Maybe he bought <laughs> yeah, it back or, or something. The containment unit's still <laughs> down there. <laughs> and then, yeah, the contain- I love the last shot of the containment unit where the warning light is blinking red. Something bad is coming. Yep. And that's yeah. fantastic. Um, uh, and in fact, Peck is coming back for the next movie. We saw him in the trailer for the, yeah. for the Frozen Empire movie, which will be good. <laughs> I love that scene. He's going to do you. I'm not turning it off. The other, the con ed guy. I'm not turning yeah. it off. I'm not touching <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> that was great. Oh man. <laughs> so we talked about ghosts and the legacy of ghosts in our lives. We could, we, there's other things we could talk about, but the tension between the supernatural and science, but for that, definitely listen to mysterious world because that's, we talk about that all the time there. Anything else you want to talk about? Any other notes on this movie before we wrap things up? Victor? I'm just really glad they made it. It's a very good continuation of the stories. As I mentioned, Ghostbusters has been a part of my life since seeing the original movie with my dad, and they did it. They they did it right in this movie. Excellent. Rob, anything left to say? I really enjoyed it. I wish that we could have seen more of what Egon was doing beforehand. It obviously we saw the after effects of it, but he caught seemingly the gate or the key master, and that's who was released. Like how did the key master and the gatekeeper come about if he already had this fail safe happening? Right. Um, kind of a prequel to this one. I think it would be cool to see, but I really enjoyed it. I think it was a great movie, great homage, pulling a lot of stuff from the first one. And I'm looking forward to seeing what the frozen, frozen kingdom is the next frozen one? empire. Cause it's frozen the empire, empire state. Yeah. And it's also the empire ah. of the, the new baddie that we get. Right. And frozen. So we'll probably have some, we'll yeah. have references to Elsa. Uh, I'm sure. <laughs> Just let it go, Ray. Let it go. That'll be Venkman. Excellent. Excellent. I guess that should wrap it up this discussion. And before we go, we always want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of movies and TV shows. This time we want to thank Joseph R., Kelly W., Curtis C., Teresa M., and Marcello P. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of movies and TV shows and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them in helping us make more of these shows by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So we'd love to know what you thought of Ghostbusters Afterlife or anything we had to say about it, which you can do by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash secrets or the StarQuest Facebook page or send an email to secrets at sqpn.com or visit the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. Until next time, Rob Leonardi, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Ghostbusters Afterlife. You're welcome, and don't forget who you need to call. <laughs> Obviously you guys. And yeah. Victor Lambs, <laughs> thank you as well. Thanks, Dom. Bustin makes me feel good. And we should get back together again, by the way, when Frozen Absolutely. Empire comes out. Talk about that. We'll do an Absolutely. episode of that. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of movies and TV shows on StarQuest. And remember, don't be yourself. Here's another show on the StarQuest network you're sure to enjoy. The Secrets of Middle Earth. Find it wherever you can find podcasts or at sqpn.com slash Middle Earth. We'd like to thank Patrick McCaffrey of Moonshadow Studios for editing this episode. To have your audio edited professionally and with care, check out more of Patrick's work at moonshadowstudios.biz. That's moonshadowstudios.biz. 